Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on differential equations. This is video number 31, or video 5 in the subsection on Laplace's equation. Specifically, I'm going to put Laplace's equation from its rectangular coordinates into spherical coordinates and use the method of separation of variables to separate it out into three ordinary differential equations, namely the radial equation, the polar equation, and the azimuthal equation. The previous videos to this are as follows. In videos 20 through to 23, I discussed Laplace's equation, proved its first and second uniqueness theorem, uh, theorems, excuse me, and I also showed that Laplace's equation does not permit local maxima or minima. In video 24, I discussed separation of variables. Videos 26 through to 28, I did three examples of separation of variables, and it was Laplace's equation I used in each time. And in video number 30, I discussed polar coordinates. Now in video number 33, I'm going to discuss the Laplacian in spherical coordinates. And we're actually going to use it in, the, in this video, but I, I don't think it's very important that you know how to prove Laplace's or the Laplacian in spherical coordinates in order to understand this. So what we have at the moment is Laplace's equation. It says that if you take the Laplacian of a function, a scalar function, let's say v, it's equal to zero. Now the Laplacian in rectangular coordinates is written as del 2 del x squared plus del 2 del y squared plus del 2 del z squared. Now if we move from rectangular to spherical coordinates, the Laplacian looks nothing like it used to. It's quite complicated in fact, and we break it down into uh, three, we'll say three uh, coordinates, namely the radial coordinate, the polar angle coordinate, and the azimuthal coordinate. So r, theta, and phi. And like I said, you can look at video 33 if you want to do that, or if you just want to discuss polar coordinates, look at video number 30. So this is how we write the Laplacian in polar coordinates. It's quite involved. And I'd like you to note, by the way, that we have a product rule here and a product rule here. So the easiest way to manipulate this is to keep, it, keep we'll say, these product rules as operators and just leave them. Don't do anything with them but just keep them as, as they are. So, moving on. So on the top left of your screen, I've written the Laplacian in spherical coordinates and have applied it to Laplace's equation, writing Laplace's equation in spherical coordinates. So what we have is as follows. We have one over small r squared, which is the radius, and we have all the other operators, which are as normal. Now notice we've I've put in the function v, here, here, and here. So the operators that we have, for example, we have del del phi, or excuse me, del del theta, and we have del 2 del phi squared. We have lots of operators. So what we'd like to do is separate this out into three, uh, three ordinary differential equations. One for the radial, one for the angular, or the polar coordinate, and one for the azimuthal coordinate. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that our function v which is a function of three variables, r, theta, and phi, can be broken down into a function of just the radius and a function just of the angular coordinates. Now notice we only separate out one variable at a time, and in this case, it is the radial coordinate. The next thing we need to know is if we take the derivative with respect to the radius of our new function, r times y, we'll notice that y is not a function of r and essentially is a constant and can come out. And as a result, you get y times del capital R del R. Similarly, if we have the second derivative with respect to phi, this is an angular derivative. It only, it only influences or impacts on the y function. And as a result, r is essentially a constant and can come out. So what I've done in the top right of your screen is I've plugged in the new equation, v is equal to r times y. And it's the exact same as we had on the left side, just with v is equal to r times y instead of, uh, in, yeah, v is equal to r times y. Now, notice, like I said, that we can take out, uh, in this case, we can take out y. And in this case up here, we can take out r. So what I've done is I've taken out y here, and I've taken out r. I've also taken out r in the azimuthal equation here. Or excuse me, I've taken R in the azimuthal equation here. 
Now the next thing we need to do is divide across by v, which is r times y. But I'm also, for convenience, going to, divide, going to multiply across by r squared, small r to be squared. And if we do that, we rewrite the equation as follows. So we have something, it's essentially just a function of capital R. We have something here, which is just a function of, uh, we'll say theta. Well, it's just the operator on theta, but y is a function of both the angular coordinates. Now we have something here which is just operating on the angular coordinates, but we have this we have this sine squared theta component as well. So essentially we can break it down into we have a radial equation and we have two angular equations. And this of course equals zero. So the next thing we need to do is separate them out. And of course we know that this is equal to a separation constant. So I've called the separation constant capital A. So you have one over capital R, and then with the operator del del R, R squared, del capital R del R. And we have something much longer on the, uh, on the other side of the equation. And I've called it, so we had this minus sign by the way of course, because you'd bring the angular equation across the, uh, across the boundary. So this gives us two equations. It gives us first of all the radial equation. It's called so because it only has a function of the radius. This is the radial equation. And we can see there are, it's a very important equation as I'll discuss later on. And we're left with the angular equation, called so obviously because it's a function of both theta and phi. And we have our separation constant A. Now, we still have to separate out the, the two functions which y is a function of. Namely, y at the moment is both a function of theta and of phi. So we separate out these variables, saying they can be made of a product of uh, a function of theta and a function of phi. So this is this is capital theta. Uh, I find it quite difficult to draw, if I'm honest with you. So we have capital theta multiplied by capital phi. So up on the top right of your screen, I've just plugged y is equal to theta times phi, capital theta times capital phi, into the angular equation. So we have the product here product here, here, and here. Now just like previously, we note that if we take the theta derivative, it only affects the theta equation, and uh, the theta, yeah, well I suppose the theta function, so the phi function is a constant to be brought outside. And similarly when we take the phi derivative, it only affects the phi function so we can take out theta. So doing that, what we get is as follows we get, we'll say, phi over phi and theta, and we have del del theta and something just a function of theta. And we have something kind of similar on the, uh, uh, as well for, we'll say, the phi coordinates. Notice that we can cross out phi here, and we can cross out theta here. If we do that, it seems that we just have a function of theta here, or an operator involving theta here, and an operator involving phi here, because I've also multiplied across by sine squared theta. And after missing a theta, there should be a sine squared theta. To bear with me, I'm after noticing a typo. There's also, I'm after noticing a typo. Going from the top right of your screen where I had sine theta and sine squared theta here, I have multiplied across by I will be in a moment multiplying across by sine squared theta, but you, you'll, I'm sure you can, you can follow where I am. My next step is definitely correct. So when I multiply across by sine squared theta, which I really didn't show, what we get is as follows. We get this sine theta term on top here. We get a times sine squared theta here. And there is no sine squared component on the phi equation here. Now this, of course, has to be equal to a separation constant because we're after separating out the functions. So we have, like going back to the other side, we had we had theta, a function of theta and a function of phi. So when I multiply by across by sine squared theta, a has to be part of the theta equation because we're multiplying across by sine squared theta. And that's what I have up here. So we have two equations equal. They must be equal for all space and all time. We call them equal, equal to a constant which we call b, the other separation constant. This gives us a further two equations. It gives us the azimuthal equation, and it gives us the radial equation. 
So the piezo multiple equation is very straightforward and, you, and to solve it is also very, very simple. Now, the most common way to write the radial equation is as follows. So we divide across, or we, we divide across by sine squared theta and we arrange it like this. So what we do is we keep the, we, I suppose, keep it as an operator. And we have the separation constant A on the, uh, the other side of the equal sign. And we call this equation the polar angle equation. So you have the azimuthal equation and the polar angle equation. So what we've done is as follows. We have broken down our function, our scalar function V, a function of the radius, the polar angle and the azimuthal angle into the product of three functions, each of one variable. The radial coordinate or the radial function is a solution to the radial equation. The theta coordinate is a function of the polar angle equation and the phi coordinate is a function of the uh, of the azimuthal equation. Next, what I think is very interesting is this, and I suppose it's, it's, it's something you surely will see it in the future, but just might answer something very quickly for you. That the quantum numbers come from these, these particular equations. Because what we do is we later on we solve the Schrodinger equation and we solve it in polar coordinates. Now we've just seen that when we solve something in polar coordinates, we get a number of, uh, of separation constants, namely we got A and B. So I'm going to tell you that in the uh, solutions to these equations, you'll find that the, the, co the separation constant n sub s comes from solving the azimuthal equation. And the separation constant l comes from solving the polar equation. And finally then, when you solve the radial equation, you plug both m sub s and l into the radial equation. And the radial equation will give us the principal quantum number and it'll also give the j quantum number and it will give the limits on L and S according to N. So that's where they come from. They are really just the separation constants. So like I said, the radial, the radial equation will limit the magnetic quantum number and the, angular, um, the orbital angular momentum quantum number as well, according to the principal quantum number. So that was pretty quick. Uh, I hope it's pretty straightforward and, and that I didn't, I didn't lose you with my typo here. So going from here down, there should be, the sign The sign should be there, I just left it out because multiplying from, going from here to here, I multiplied across by sine squared, is sine squared theta. Okay, so thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.